Hello, and welcome to the Great Birth Rebellion podcast, where we grapple with current research to help you get the best out of your pregnancy, birth, and postpartum journey, while still challenging the dominant birth culture. I'm your host, Dr. Melanie Jackson at Melanie the Midwife, and I'm joined weekly by my co-host, B from Core and Flora Store, and this is The Great Birth Rebellion. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of The Great Birth Rebellion. You're back here this week with B and I, who we have invited one of our dear friends. Well, actually, Liz, I've read a lot of your stuff, but I think we've met three or four times and partied probably that many times too, I think. In yeah, the- I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but B and Liz, you guys go way back. We haven't actually ever partied together. No, that's we not have. How we became friends. <laughs> I'm sure there've been a few conference dance floors. Mm-hmm. We met in Prague, Liz and I. That's how fancy our relationship is. We did. Very fancy. We, did. we met at the ICM yeah. in what year was that? 2014. We're nearly. It's nearly our 10 year friendship anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Wow. And when I met Liz, she was doing her PhD and she was just, you know, near the epitome of a woman that's mothering and contributing to women's work because you were you had four young kids at the time and you were doing your PhD and you were just trying to get your incredible research out to the world. And now 10 years on, look at all the amazing things you're still doing. So Huge honour to have you on today, a, a lover of your midwifery work and just your personality alongside that. So it's a really, it's beautiful to have you on the potty today. Thank you. <laughs> so Liz or Elizabeth for formal, so if you're ever looking for any of her papers, it'll be under Elizabeth Newham. But we're going to call you Liz today because that's what your friends call you. Now, you. Liz, Dr. Liz is senior lecturer at <laughs> senior lecturer at the University of Newcastle here in Australia. And what was your PhD topic? PhD topic was um, looking at it was an ethnography of hospital birth culture using epidural analgesia as a kind of vehicle in to look at that. And I think one of the one of the really interesting things I did was a lit review on I did a critical lit review of the scientific and medical literature on epidural analgesia and it was it was interesting to me because it really brought out these really overarching kind of belief systems that had nothing to do with the the science or the or the effects of epidural analgesia you know, and one of these was kind of like pain relief as progress. One one of the really strong ones was labour pain is the worst possible pain imaginable. Women can't deal with it. We have to relieve it as medics and this idea of pain relief as progress. So why would you why would you want to experience pain? It completely just kind of um and these were what all of these papers would start with. And this is, you know kind of medical research wow. having really, these really yeah. strong underlying ideology essentially which you know um you've got a beautiful ebook called the humanization of childbirth and in it is a quote around how you know for a really short period of us birthing so really just the last 50 to 100 years the biggest kind of emphasis on childbirth has been that the pain is unbearable and we can't do it. However, our longer history, however long we've been birthing for, is that we are capable. And that far outweighs this tiny little part. However, we are living in this tiny little part. And many of us, and and, I mean, I've always worked with epidurals, but midwives and and women who have supported birth and people who have supported birth for a long time have seen birth without epidural and birth with and so it's fascinating that in just really one generation there has been this incredible belief system change all to do with pain which has been driven by technology Mm. yeah 
good points there. And I think, I mean, we I think it's something that is really on people's minds. You know, there's a fear about it. There's a fear about birth, but there's a fear about pain. Um, people want to know about it, how to manage it, what to do about it. And I think, I mean, I don't have anything against with epidural analgesia as a thing specifically. You know, it's not like I'm saying no one should get one or they're all evil or anything like that. But I don't think that the information is presented clearly. And th- this was, I guess, my point about that research. Um, the medical research is already biased. It's already coming from a position that says women can't cope with this. We have to take it away. And so, you know, if we're not having a clear conversation about what it is and what it entails and you know, what epidural does is switches off your endogenous oxytocin and it changes the whole birth physiology. And I don't think women are being told that when they ask for one in labour, you know. Or when they're really affected, I mean, it's affected us on a human race level because this is what Rhea and I talked about. We talked about this in the other podcast we recorded around statistics is that what oxytocin researchers are now finding is that our capacity to receive oxytocin is decreasing throughout the generations. So if a woman or a pregnant person is told, hey, if you have this epidural, it's going to switch off your oxytocin. Therefore, you're not going to get that euphoria and that elation. It doesn't mean that you can't win that back, right? We did that talk yes. with Sarah Buckley. Right? Absolutely. It doesn't mean it's gone forever, but often women don't because of the interventions that lead on from epidurals. Mm-hmm. And so talking vacuum forceps, separation from baby, and also just the trauma that is the postnatal period now because of how our culture lives, so disconnected, so unsupported. And so there often isn't a chance. Like I'll recommend people do skin to skin when their baby's five or six months old and they'll look at me like, oh, no one's ever told me to do that. Yeah, Um, And so the recovery process isn't talked about either. But if you're told, hey, your baby's chance of uh, receiving oxytocin, the hormone for connection and love and empathy is decreased and then their child is going to be decreased. Like this is an intergenerational thing you know I mean I feel this way deeply about most things in the maternity care system what it comes down to is lack of trust we don't trust that birth will unfold the way it needs to so that affects our whole perception yeah and I think there's two things that I'm just writing little notes to myself as you talk because I'm incredibly forgetful but uh, that that focus on the pain of labor rather than the pain of intervention was also something that was really clear throughout Mm. the medical literature they didn't care about the pain of having a third or fourth degree tear from an instrumental birth caused by having an epidural. You know, they there was no discussion about any of that kind of pain. post cesarean section a, scar pain. Yeah. Nothing. And, and I heard a really interesting point once at Kirsten Ugnes Moberg at one of the ACM conferences. It might have been the normal birth an ACM conference in Sydney. And she made a point in one, she was a keynote, and she made a point about the fact that she said um, what that they've found that when you ha- uh, women who have an epidural can actually have a higher, uh, their memory of pain is more than women who have gone through a normal physiological birth. And she said uh, she thinks it's probably because when you have the epidural and the hormonal feedback loop stops because the oxytocin stops being produced um then they don't have the amnesia hormones that come with the beta endorphins that makes you kind of forget things so about birth so um, you know i guess my question is kind of like if we now have quite a lot of research that says epidural analgesia may not actually work for a start it may not increase birth satisfaction. We know there's research about that. It may make you remember the pain of childbirth more, you know, before it gets put in than not having one at all. And so, you know, it kind of begs the question about why we are, why we think this is a really great intervention to have during labour, particularly when it comes with so many. Uh, risk factors 
And I'm not saying that we think that, as in us three think that, because we obviously don't think that. But, you know, as a general kind of societal view, I think it, it it's nearly like just this kind of risk-free thing. And it's really not. So, yeah, that's what took me in. And that's what I was thinking when I went into the PhD. And obviously when you do something like an ethnography, other things happen in that, you know, so there was a lot of other stuff that came out of that. It wasn't necessarily to do with epidurals, but it was to do with the culture of hospital birth. And some of that, you know, women being told they have to have an epidural, the the systems that are kind of in place in a hospital antagonise or don't support normal physiological processes. Mm. They kind of work against them. And that was one of the other findings of my research, which I called, you know, institutional paradox. It's like we put all these women in this place to try and keep them safe and we do all these things to keep them safe and keep birth safe and keep babies alive. And this is the story that we're telling ourselves. And in actual fact, the things that really are being done to create this safety, perception of safety, come with a lot of risk, but they don't talk about those risks. Mm. much not much you know I talk about a lot about the risks of letting things be physiological there's you know there's a kind of um, great fear about that so it's not it's not just not going to work in there <laughs> that's my conclusion you know well and yeah and- I mean I you know and that, again I'm not saying that there's not a time and a place for this stuff to happen. Of course there is. But, yeah, as a place, as a, as the main place of birthing in a culture, I don't think hospitals are the place that should be happening. Mm. I think there's Well, they risk, are now you know. because of what we've created, right? They are mm. because of the, like, the system has created the belief that feeds the system. Yeah. And so it was really interesting. System. Yeah. And when I... I remember doing one of those, you know, when you're doing your PhD and you, you get up and do your talk at the school level or, you know, the school research week or whatever. And I remember I just kind of made this conclusion and I was saying it in the in the talk, hospital, we have to question whether hospitals are the safest place to have a baby. And I remember the head of school at the time going, hang on, like you might need to tone that down a bit, Liz. Like that's a bit of a, you know, hardcore kind of um thing to say and it was like maybe a week or two weeks later the birthplace the UK birthplace study came out which confirmed like it was like the quantitative data that just completely um, confirmed that statement which was yeah you are going to have more intervention in a hospital labor ward and you're going to have less intervention the further away from that you get Mm-hmm. And for, you know, low risk women, and I know there's problems with categorization, but there's no, absolutely no change in outcome, you know, except that you have less intervention and higher rates of vaginal birth, the further away from a hospital you get. Mm-hmm. So I, was, I remember feeling quite satisfied when that came out because I was like, yes, I can say it because it's true. Now we've got the quantitative evidence to prove it, you know. Yes. Um, and our place of birth study in Australia is four years old. So if we go by, you know, the rule that it takes 11 to 17 years to come into practice, we've really only got another seven years to go. Well, and Liz, today we invited you to, I love that you, uh, you're just like a rebel like us, just challenging the, the the idea that the system is the best and that hospitals are the best and we should all go there. And like you said, we're not suggesting that uh nobody should go to hospital and probably you're in the same camp as B&I is that some people need a hospital but most people probably don't. Um, Liz is nodding. And yeah. <laughs> um, that's that's a scientific statement, right? Well, our, that yeah. saying is scientific because the majority of people people believe they need the hospital and that is why it is they think they need it. 
It's that belief system of really unpacking that with good information, which is what we're saying we've got now. Like we've actually got the evidence to debunk all those myths. Can I just pause for a second? Liz used that beautiful fancy word ethnography. Um, but anyone else who can't say it and doesn't know what it means, do you just want to give us a little snippet of what that is? Because I'm sure there's a couple of people that are like, she did what? Just to yeah. explain that for those that aren't in the research yeah, world. Sorry, then, sorry. It's, no, it's, it's basically right. ethnography is a study of culture. It comes yeah. from, um, it comes out of anthropology, but also now sociology uses ethnography quite a lot. So, and again, it started off kind of looking, you know, as the, it's called, quite colonizing in a way I mean like so many things were but are still but so it was very much about going and observing these kind of exotic other cultures and taking notes and trying to work out uh rituals and myths and belief systems and kinship systems and that kind of thing but then sort of in the 40s and 50s I think the American sociology took a bit of a different turn and and people started using it to look at our own cultures and our own cultural beliefs and our own, so kind of turning it back on ourselves. And um, there is a whole branch of that called medical anthropology that studies medical belief systems. And um, some of those might be different cultural beliefs. Uh, there's also a lot on the Western medical system as well. So, yeah, looking is really just a study of culture in however you want to do it and whichever culture you're looking at. Liz, one day um, I need to have a very dorky academic conversation with you about authoritative knowledge. Oh, yes. I'd love to do that. <laughs> so juicy, right? And people, yeah. oh, my gosh, just the juiciest. I've got a whole chapter in my thesis on authoritative knowledge. Yeah. And everyone's like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh, let me tell you about yeah. it. But it's yeah. probably a whole episode and very, very dorky. Yeah, um, yeah. But- <laughs> I'd love to talk about knowledge with you because <laughs> that, it, it obviously it was formed a, a big part of my own thesis as well. I mean, I talked about that a little bit, and which is sort of that knowledge is, you know, is I remember that the quote from Jordan is brilliant. It's like yeah. it's it's it's. Well, it's authoritative not, not because it's right but because it's counted or something like counts. that that's right authoritative knowledge is not authoritative because it's right it's authoritative because it counts yeah and yes we can have a whole conversation yeah yeah but today Liz we wanted to talk to you about informed consent and ethics yeah but specifically there's a paper that that you've written called beyond autonomy Care ethics for midwifery and the humanization of birth. And in preparing for this episode, I've just like run my highlighter ragged. I think I highlighted the whole thing because it's basically quote after quote of amazing sentences that really explain the system, uh, bioethics, all the things. So I have I have a list of questions that I wanted to ask you about your research. And anyone listening along, if you wanted to read some of Liz's papers, we can put them in the resource folders um, for you to access. So Liz, anyone who's on our mailing list can just access the papers that we use to um, yeah, form our podcast. So you guys can have a read of this and I would highly, highly recommend it. I do feel like it's within the reach of non-researchy people. And so- I think so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As I was reading, I was like, anyone could read this and really get something out of it. So, I mean- do you want to introduce this paper? Are you familiar with it enough that, yeah. <laughs> like, I know it was written in 2019 and we people who are in research are quite prolific and lose track of all the amazing things that we've said in the past. Mm. Um, so do you want to give us a bit of a rundown of the paper and then I've got some questions. Yeah, yeah, okay. no, that's good. <laughs> it's funny because I was just saying to you before uh, before we started Mel I was like I feel like I have to reread swat up on my own things in case I've forgotten what I've said but yeah um no essentially that paper came about because what I kind of realized at the end of the PhD or as I was writing the PhD and some of the papers that came out of that was that I started with that whole knowledge production thing and yeah you know, yeah you know, whose knowledge is it who makes the knowledge how does it trickle down and that's where that, you know, that kind of scientific, the 
lit, the critical review of the scientific literature on epidural started that process off. It was kind of like, this is what they believe about pain. Then that kind of leaks into policy. You know, then the whole that whole thing about interventions are seen as safe and normal birth is seen as risky. So that also influences policy handouts and all of that kind of stuff. So what women are being told about epidural analgesia is full of all this stuff that is not actually A, evidence-based, B, unbiased, and C, letting them make an informed decision. So that was kind of where my thinking was. And I was like, we can't talk about informed consent in this whole process because it's not happening. Yeah, so that's kind of where it came from. And I remember reading Mavis Kirkham's work as a student midwife and it changed the way I looked at things. And she talked about, she wrote the the whole kind of, this whole book on the mother-midwife relationship. And one of the things that interrupts that relationship is the system, basically, or like the policies of the system. And her work, it had also included ethnographic research. So I got in touch with Mavis and said, I'm having this idea. I don't think we can talk about informed consent properly in in the way that things are happening now. It's not real. It's, <laughs> and so then asked her if she wanted to, you know, what she thought about that. And we start, we ended up writing this paper about it based on both of our ethnographic work, but extending it from the PhD into something else. And the other thing that prompted that paper was reading Jennifer McClellan's piece on care ethics. And I, it, I don't think she's written anything else since then or what she's doing, but um, it really resonated with me. And so I've taken it, I guess I just took that idea and ran with it and kind of started to incorporate it into my thinking. And that's developed even further since that paper. So yeah. So this paper talks about going beyond autonomy and you first start, like, what do you mean by autonomy? It's not really, I don't think it's a word that we use in society enough, Uh, but what does it mean to have autonomy? So it basically means self-rule. I mean, that's the underlying, you know, what's the word for the meaning of words <laughs> you know that's the definition etiology or whatever the definition yeah so I mean from the Greek self-rule autonomos that's where it comes from so it really it means I get to make the decisions about my body I get to make all the decisions about my body that happen to me as a person that are you know within my control and in some ways I now prefer to talk about self-determination rather than autonomy could because yeah, the whole this whole idea about autonomy is problematic. But the other thing, I suppose, in terms of midwifery practice is that autonomy is one of the four bioethical principles which govern sort of, you know, healthcare ethics generally. It's, you know, it pr- maybe more prevalent in medical ethics, but as midwives, we learn about ethics from that bioethical framework. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, do good, do no harm, respect autonomy and justice is the other one. Yeah. So that's what I suppose where I'm coming from in terms of what autonomy means. So to add in there, Mel, you know, you just said something, really made a really good point that autonomy isn't a word that we use a lot in our culture. Um, It isn't a word that is, you know, dropped into most day-to-day sentences. And I would extend on that and say that I think it's because most of us actually don't have it in most of our day-to-day life. You know, we're not raised as children to have self-rule over our bodies. We're not encouraged to listen to our instincts and really have good autonomy. And I know a lot is changing. But I think it's a word that's not used because it's a word that's not felt and not displayed a lot, especially most of us suffer that good girl syndrome. And when you've been conditioned to be good, your autonomy goes out the window. And so, yeah, it's not just a word that's not used. It's a word that's not fully known to us in our bodies as women. 
And I think that's the point that you make in this paper too. You call it in within maternity care, uh, you say that respect for autonomy, so respect for self-rule and self-governance over your body has become rhetorical within the maternity care system. So can we talk about that? What what do you mean by like a rhetorical autonomy when you enter into a hospital system? What I mean, I suppose what I mean is that it, there's a lot of lip service to consent and informed consent. And you hear the term a lot. It, well, you used to. I mean, I haven't sort of been in practice for a while now, but it's part of that day-to-day talk, you know, even down to the point of, you know, this person has to go and sign this consent form. A consent form is based on the idea of informed consent. So this person has had everything explained to them about their procedure or the operation or whatever it is, and they have enough information to make a decision. And the decision has to be one that suits them. And I think when it comes to uh, the medical system more broadly or other branches of medicine that isn't obstetrics, um, the idea of autonomy is probably, uh, might be more valued. I think the maternity system in particular has a problem with autonomy because, uh, well, several reasons. One is the historical gender you know, violence and patriarchy and all of that stuff that that medicalised birth is associated with. And the other is that you've got a baby inside a woman's body. So they want to be able to access the baby. Uh, and the only way to do that is through the woman. So you're kind of, that's the other bit of the work that we do that isn't in other branches of healthcare necessarily. Um, so what I mean by that is there's there's a lot of talk about consent, there's a lot of talk about informed consent, but it's not really happening. It can't it can't be happening because <laughs> because there are so many false premises that you know that we've just talked about that mean that the information isn't even clear to start with. You know, hospitals aren't safe places to have babies. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about, you know, the the risks associated with intervention. So that's what I mean by rhetorical autonomy. And what I think is happening is, and, you know, I reference the work that's been done previously and alongside my work around birth trauma. And Beck Jenkinson did a really good paper on how women are bullied and coerced and what that looks like. Um, The fact that bullying and coercion occur so frequently in maternity services means that that informed consent is not working, that autonomy is not a principle that's being upheld Mm -hmm. in maternity systems. And, I mean, you know, Rachel Reed's done a lot of work on that and there's globally such a a cry out for this you know just really consistent kind of uh, lack of appreciation for people's autonomy yeah and in your paper you said that informed consent practices are still highly geared towards the gaining of consent rather than giving full and unbiased information in order for the person to either consent or to refuse that proposed treatment or intervention. So when someone says, I've got to go and get consent from this woman, they're assuming that the woman's going to say yes because of the information they're about to deliver her. And then there's just a procedural step of getting a signature on a line. And then they've ticked the box of having gotten informed consent, but they skipped the whole part of actually giving information. And yeah. yeah, or they get the answer and then say something else that is going to coerce, you know, the decision. And often women talk about this as the dead baby card or the, you know, and you see that a lot. I mean, I don't, we don't really need any, any references. 
<laughs> but there are them. I mean, they were around. That's what I mean to say. I did an um, Instagram post the other day talking about, you know, I remember being and been a midwife for a number of years and just sitting in the tea room and the registrar coming in and saying, oh, they don't want the induction. And the head consultant just saying, we'll use the D word until they say yes. Mm. And the D word being the dead word. And uh, the amount of comments on the Instagram posts of people just saying, yeah, this happened to me. And yeah. It's, um, and so, and that's, told, co- that, that, is, that is not informed consent. That's no. coercion. You know, and I mean, informed I, consent would be your the risk of your baby dying from 20 weeks of pregnancy to 28 days of life is 1% because that's what it is in this country. Our perinatal death rate is 10.1 per 1,000 as per our 2020 stats, which are the latest stats. So that's 1%. It can also be said the chance of your baby dying from 20 weeks of pregnancy to 28 days of life post-birth, and this includes everyone so it includes twins triplets quadruplets really unwell babies babies born at 20 weeks babies born premature the chance of that not happening is 99 percent. yeah and the way that risk is dying and they hear or they probably you know people interpret that as my baby has a really high chance of dying well if you say yeah the chance is one percent and that includes everyone so your chance as a well person, for example, is lower than that, then people are able to make better decisions on that. But it's just coercion and fear. Yeah. And, we don't and always- yeah, and the thing about risk is that it's not an individual science. You, it's only ever about population, uh, population numbers. So even if you, even if we know that there is a risk of one in a hundred, say, for something. You still don't know if the person sitting in front of you is the one or the 99. And that really has to be made clear as well that, it, you know, yeah, which is why the person should only make that decision for themselves, what it is that they want to pursue for the next, you know, whatever the thing is, intervention or not intervention. Or, and I guess the thing that bothers me the most about all of this is that we we say that we have codes of ethics and we say that we have, um, you know, that healthcare professions are bound by ethical behaviours and ethical frameworks and yet all of this stuff can happen uh, even underneath these frameworks. And that's why that's kind of the other thing that took me to care ethics because I thought, well, the whole framework's kind of not working. If this can all happen, if this kind of abuse and coercion and can all happen within these ethical frameworks where we're talking about autonomy and we can tick that box because we've got informed consent, then it's not working. We have to think of another way to think about ethics in when it comes to maternity care and maternity services and childbirth. Mm. And and you you know that with the informed consent idea, again, you talk about this r- rhetorical informed consent just like there's rhetorical autonomy where we're just paying lip service to these words these buzzwords and and in the paper you use the term escalating intrusion as a way of you know defining the behaviors that the system uses to obtain compliance from women and so Yes, yeah, so you called it escalating intrusion and it's the intensifying series of behaviours designed to in- obtain compliance and they range from manipulation to assault. And, I mean, this, everybody midwife listening will know about the escalation process that happens in hospitals. I I mean, I think it's written down. It's, it's, it's a clear step-by-step process by which if a woman declines the option that is in line with the policy that that gets escalated up the line. So if you're being cared for by a midwife and the midwife says, hey, it's time for your four-hour vaginal examination or whatever it is they want to do, and you say, no, thank you, I don't want one of those, then the midwife's obliged to go and speak to the team leader or whoever's above them in the hierarchy and say, oh, actually, the woman's declined. So then the team leader goes and says to the woman, oh, I hear you've declined the four-hour vaginal examination. We would recommend it. It's part of our policy. Words, words, words that somehow will try and elicit compliance, not necessarily the giving of information. And then if the woman says no to the team leader, that team leader's got to 
step above her of who she needs to talk to. So, you know, you just keep escalating up the line until you drag some doctor out of the office that is in charge of everybody who's now tasked with the job of giving as much coercive language to this process to force the woman to comply with what they wanted her to comply with in the first place. Mm. And so this is what women talk about of having to fight for their bodily autonomy in hospital because they're in labour, they're contracting. If they don't have any kind of epidural or pain relief on board, they're doing all of that and negotiating care with an escalating chain of people just because they declined what was in the policy. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what escalating intrusion is, where they where they layer and layer and layer on the the pressure until you just get so tired with it that you give up and say yes. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason that that can occur is because under our current ethical frameworks, those clinicians, uh, their allegiance is to the hospital policy not to the woman, and this is where the crux of the problem is. Tell us about that crux. Yeah, and I think that's tied in with, you know, hospital policies are also written from that medico-legal point of view. You know, that's why they will always put a CTG on rather than not put a CTG on because that whole thing is about what will stand up in a court of law. and even though we know there's no evidence to support the fact, you know, to support the use of CTG as any kind of indication of fetal outcome, in court it looks better to be, to be able to produce a printout to say this baby's heart rate looked fine than not to be able to produce it. You know, so th- I think they are all tied up together and and the policies are very much, yeah, kind of tied up in that. Yeah. In that system. And, and so let's talk about the crux of the problem. Oh yes. I think we we were talking we were about to we were about to reveal the crux. And there's <laughs> there was a winning quote in, in your paper, and you said that institutionalized birth as it currently is organized is inherently unethical. Midwives and doctors are expected to place allegiance to hospital policy or cultural practices over respect for the wishes and needs of women. And I bet you had a good cup of tea after you wrote that sentence. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> right? So, And I feel like this is the absolute crux of the problem. Mm. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yes. So tell, <laughs> tell us all about that problem, that problem of allegiances. And in the paper you talked about the power imbalance and how women don't realise there's a power imbalance, and that's part of the problem. Yeah, well, part of the problem is that nobody realises there's a power imbalance. So we, you know, one of the problems of uh, kind of putting autonomy up there as the ethical principle that we all have to abide by is because it doesn't recognise the inherent inequality between people. So autonomy comes from sort of, you know, enlightenment liberalism where, you know, it's fine to have autonomy and self-rule, but the people that had autonomy and self-rule were white aristocratic men. Okay, so that leaves a whole bunch of people out of that equation and it it still, I think, stands to this day that, you know, people of colour, women, gender diverse people, anyone that doesn't fit that kind of, you know, that historical autonomous person who could vote and own land. And there's already a flaw in in thinking that everybody's equal because we're not all equal. And then when you come into a hospital system, you there's a, there's an inequality between the fairly vulnerable state of being a cared for person and the power associated with a with being the one that is doing the caring. And care ethics really notices that power differential and says we can't talk about care without talking about vulnerability, without talking about responsibility, without talking about relationship and without talking about paying attention to that person which is at the centre of the care, you know. So autonomy really is a problematic 
way to center your ethical framework. So I think that really needs to change. And what was the other thing you asked me? <laughs> well, we were talking about the crux of the problem and how the, mm. you know, healthcare providers have their allegiance with the system instead of with women, yeah. which is that's the the ethical issue is that because their allegiance is with the system, then they're obliged to operate in that way rather than a woman-centred way. Yes. Which which highlights why informed consent and autonomy is rhetorical because it can't happen if their care providers are aligning with the system and not with the woman, then the woman exactly. does not have yeah. control. Yeah, so it actually can't happen. Right. It's not even that it doesn't happen, is it? You've just said it there yourself. That was a very good um, summation of my argument there, Mel, <laughs> which, um, you know, it actually can't happen. Right. So that's why. That's why. It's and that's quiet. also why so many midwives aren't enjoying midwifery. Yes. Because actually they're unable to practice true midwifery, which is the allegiance to the woman. That is yeah. what midwife means. Midwife means with woman. And so, you know, you want to talk burnout, right? Then this is this is the crux of it. Yeah. Because midwives and student midwives who go into midwifery are actually practicing in a completely different way to what they're taught midwifery is and what they want to do. And actually it goes against their instincts because naturally as a care provider, you you want to have that allegiance with the person you're caring for. And so that system is breaking that relationship as you started off say, talking about. And then the flow on effect from that is trauma, not just for the person and family giving birth, but for the midwives and doctors, I want to say, you know, there's yeah, totally. doctors yeah. that, are, you know, that it, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good. It can't feel good yeah. to work in that. And, you know, what I'm hearing over again, over and over again, I'm sick of the trauma I'm out. I'm quitting. And there's right? a really good mm-hmm. article this week, uh, end of last week or whenever it was, that came out, the ABC are doing a uh, some kind of investigation into birth in Australia. And there was an article, they've done a few things, but there's an article that came out last week. You should link it to this podcast. It's basically about, you know, the state of the maternity services. Nothing new to you or I, but there were some quotes from midwives at the end, which says things like, I, you know, I go to work, I try my hardest to be, you know, a really good midwife and I'm still failing and the kind of moral injury that that does and yeah there's and there's been a bit of work about that as well like the moral injury to midwives having to work in a system that actually they can't fulfill any of their midwifery philosophy and Wendy Foster's PhD I think she might be nearly finished but that was all about moral injury in Australian midwives and yeah, so it's not surprising that we have got this profession that where people are leaving in droves. Like the whole thing is kind of not sustainable and not working. And actually I've got a colleague, Rodanta van der Waal, and she's from the Netherlands. She's done some amazing work, but she's in her PhD looking at obstetric violence. And one of her papers, which I'll send you if you want, you can link it, um, is kind of saying, it's not that there's this kind of system and then there's these accidental kind of episodes of violence or, you know, obstetric violence or abuse. It's not kind of there despite everything that we're doing. It's there because it's an inherently violent system. Mm-hmm. Like these systems are colonising systems. They're patriarchal colonising systems of power that are inherently, that the whole structure of them has this kind of, is dependent, dependent upon one person's power over another. So yeah. that was, that really kind of turned things on its head for me um, as a way of thinking, you know, instead of, instead of just keeping on saying, what's wrong with the system? Why does it, you know, why can't we fix it? And why does it keep doing this stuff? And why we keep coming up with all these answers and it keeps doing this same old thing. But um, her, so she comes from an abolitionist, feminist point of view. So it's kind of like the system's broken. 
we you know we've got to leave that over there and start something new over here that's actually based on different principles yeah and that's where I think we can really use the care ethics principles if we're moving into a a new way of doing things then that's a way that we can start to structure and think about our ethical practice and one of the um in in your ebook humanizing birth there was a line in there that basically said not and I mean not in these exact words but we basically have to burn it down and start again yeah. right and I yeah. mean people ask me all the time oh my gosh how are we going to change the system I'm like do you know what mm. I think we should stop trying to do that and actually uh start just working in a way that we truly believe in and that could be the alternative I mean I work as a private midwife yeah in in that way because of that I just don't feel like all the things we're doing to try and turn around what's happening in the system is actually working. And we can see that because last week we talked about the stats here in Australia and how does every year they keep getting worse, despite the fact that the hospital pictures that they're doing the best and safest for women. It's not translating into any of the actual outcomes or data. We're seeing more trauma, more intervention, more poorer outcomes, higher cesarean section rates less satisfaction, lower breastfeeding. I mean, it's not working and I don't think anyone's, it's like the emperor's new clothes, you know, the emperor's parading down the street and everyone's going, look how nice the clothes are. And there's a few rogue rebels sort of going, ah, actually he's naked, Uh, which is what we're doing here at the Great Birth Rebellion, (laughs) calling out that the emperor's naked. So I mean, you call for the humanization of birth. So what does it mean? So we've got all these problems which which we've talked about, but how do we how do we steer the ship and actually solve them? Because I don't want to leave people with a sense of despair of like, oh no, it's terrible. And Liz, I'm so grateful that you're a senior lecturer in midwifery because you're gonna shape the student workforce who are going to become change agents through your work. So what what can we do? What hope is there? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always hope. I'm I'm a great optimist anyway. (laughs) Uh, And I think things, you know, I think we just have to keep making change. I mean, I I I suppose the things that that I think about the work that I do, I mean I greatly admire the work that you do and the work that you do be and that that kind of you know totally grassroots change is happening right here right now with the work that I do like the story that you just told me Mel about the student midwife that you might want to say <laughs> what that was um, because I think that's really relevant to this conversation but I think from the point of view of the the work that I'm doing, it's about changing the way people see things. And the more that we change, the the ideas rule the world, you know. Um, And so I know that, like I I mentioned when I first read Mavis Kirkham's work on the institution getting in the way of that midwife-woman relationship, and I remember reading it and going, right now I can it was something that I knew I could feel somehow, but I didn't have any words to explain it. So I think those mo- those defining moments where you get to think about something in a different way or have language to describe something that you didn't have before and some somehow it all starts fitting together and you can um, make changes. You know, I think it's also about, I do think it's about challenging the status quo and saying those things that, really need to be said but in a very robust and kind of you know you have to be you know you can't just jump up and down yelling about things you have to put together I think a clearly logical argument (laughs) we do have a lot more knowledge now about the kinds of systems that we're all working in you know, the decolonization kind of discussion is pretty, you know, it's around. We hear it a lot more than we used to. And I think there is a lot more criticality now about confronting those, the legacies of those systems. And I think, I feel like there is a lot of, 
I feel like there's a lot of change on the horizon. Um, you know, the reproductive justice movement is is another kind of more recent, and it's been around for a long time, but I think it's starting to come to the fore now as we recognise what the what the kind of the racist sort of structures that have been imposed on minority groups. So, you know, I feel like there's a lot going on. I feel like there's a lot of good going on. I feel like there's pockets of it here and there. And um but you know, I think that I think it will happen. The change will happen. It just whether we burn that down and start a new one, I don't know how that happens. <laughs> um yeah. Well, I suggest to people, they're like, how do we create change? And I tell people, you have to plant new seeds and wait for those seeds to grow into big shady trees and they will kill the undergrowth. That, you know, so it's a slow process. Maybe I'll plant a seed and my grandchildren will see the canopy. I don't know, you know, and then they'll talk about remember that time where doctors ruled birth and it wasn't women who were in charge. And I think if we just see ourselves as tending to the wave of change that's happening and being a part of it, a small part of tending to it, then it will eventually turn around. I mean, we were able to medicalize birth within a few hundred years. So maybe we can demedicalize it in a few hundred more. Mm. And you know, you spoke about in your paper and in your ebook about humanizing birth, and it was the exact same finding that I had from my PhD, and it was about a completely different topic. You know, I wrote about uh, free birth and high risk home birth, and how the the reaction to these birth choices should not be to sort of ostracize women who make these choices, but maybe if we humanized birth and made birth in the system a little bit more attractive and safer and appropriate, then people wouldn't be running from it. Mm. And so, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's really important as midwives that we uh, think about as as midwives or any maternity service providers really, but specifically midwives, <laughs> um, we have to look at our own part that we're playing in this whole process and that complicit, being complicit in those systems is an unpleasant fact that we need to be looking at as a profession, I think, and how do we how do we change that? I mean, midwives are throughout every hospital in Australia every hospital every nearly every birth is going to be attended by a midwife and some will be attended by a doctor you know we have we actually have a lot of power if we just decided to change things all at once mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and that's mel's got her incredible rebellious midwives what is it called assembly of rebellious assembly. midwives i pay attention it's the assembly <laughs> i mean that's what we're trying to do here right is create a whole culture of people birthing and people caring for those people birthing that that's in their power. And I do see that, like we are so different to the generations that have come before us. And that's where my optimism lies because we are becoming more compassionate. We are opening up. We're owning our mistakes with compassion and we're standing in our power and that's where the change is going to come from. Birth is that transformation into our power where we're meant to, you know, have all these people that surround us until we rise up and claim that power. And that is not happening because the support system around it that enables us to, to rise up, they don't know their power. And it's and that's that's what all this comes down to, really, is what I see. It's just a hell of a lot of fear. Antidote to fear is education and support. And that's where the change is going to happen here. Mm. And Liz, do you have any final things to add to this conversation? And we're excited too because 
Liz is going to be one of the speakers at the Convergence of Rebellious Midwives Conference, which is happening in August 2024 here in Sydney. So get on the mailing list if you want more information about that. Liz, final words of wisdom. What do we need? You know, midwives are struggling in this system because the system's not geared towards caring for midwives, just like it's not geared towards caring Mm. for men. Mm. So, that's a really good point. And I think, I mean, I think part of where I, part of my next thinking, I think, is is kind of in that piece. Yeah, like what about the midwives? What are we doing in that space? So that's a, that's a good point. But um, the final words, I think, well, I think one of the things that I tell my students is that, you know, th- that solidarity is really important, finding people who um, you can get support from, give support to talk about these things with, try and effect change in your local whatever uh, is really important. And I suppose the other thing um, is understanding the system that you're working with. And one of the most rewarding kind of kinds of feedback that I get when I present this stuff or when I've presented it in the past is like clinicians, midwives coming back to me and saying, this was really instrumental in me being able to understand the kind of, you know, understand things in a different way so that now I can actually begin to push back. I'm not sure where I was going with that now. (laughs) I feel like um, your words, I feel like what you've done is given words to what midwives midwives have a sense that something's not right yeah but we can't work out what it is like why what's going on and I feel like your work and your work in ethnography has given some words and explanation to how we got here and why we're here yeah yeah and sometimes just understanding that gives a little bit more sort of solace in what's going on and that actually you know this problem can't be solved by one hero midwife in a hospital saving all the women because this is a deep-seated deep-rooted like fundamental foundation problem with the system that one person is not going to be able to turn around by themselves yeah Um, There's also a starting point, though, for making that change. And that in that humanization ebook that you were talking about, we have tried to include more practical, you know, less theoretical and more practical kind of everyday things to do. And that includes things like being, but just being, um, just having an awareness, I suppose, of where, how hospital policies get written, who writes them, what are the underlying mechanisms or belief systems you know, under them? Are they actually fair and equitable? What happens to the woman when she declines it? That kind of thing. If you can start working at that level, then I think, you know, we will see some change as well as working at every level, obviously. Mm. So we're not supposed to just go to work and start pointing out all the things that are wrong. That's wrong. (laughs) That's wrong. That's wrong. Probably won't be received, but you can get involved in something that will create a small piece of change And that will be your job in the change wave. Magic. Thanks for being here, Liz. That was insightful. And all of the research that we've spoken about today will be in the resource folder. So if you want that information, all you have to do is sign up to the mailing list and you get a link with all the resources for all the episodes. And if you want to hear Liz talk again on this this and many other topics, I'm sure, then come along to the Convergence of Rebellious Midwives Conference, which is happening in Sydney in August 2024. And we will see you on the next episode of The Great Birth Rebellion. Thank you. I wanted, I wanted to say, and the dance floor. Yes, <laughs> and the dance we, need to start, and we need to start finishing these episodes. We'll <laughs> see you on the dance floor. We we are actually the 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 um convergence the rebellious convergence conference whatever I'm calling it um there's a the, there's going to be a lot of dancing excellent that is as it should be it sounds oh. like an amazing thing three days 
Well, it'll be, yeah, Friday evening, which will be like the opening ceremony, but not uh, like yeah. those boring. Every single element of this conference needs to be the full experience. Thanks for listening with us today. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favourite podcast platform and join our mailing list at melaniethemidwife.com. Mel sends out weekly emails with access to all the evidence we use in this podcast. You can find out more about Mel at melaniethemidwife.com and find out more about me, Fee, at coreandfloor.com.au. We can't wait to bring you next week's episode of The Great Birth Rebellion. Yeah! Yeah! (laughs) All right.